Over the past ten years, Dr. King, a Nobel Peace Prize winner, has been increasingly concerned with developing non-violent mass tactics for bringing about revolutionary social change. The riots and other events of this past violent year in the United States and around the world have challenged Dr. King's approach more harshly than ever before. Part of Dr. King's recent response has been to plan an unprecedented camp-in in Washington for the spring of 1968. And beyond that, to be more urgently concerned with thinking out non-violent strategies for facing international social problems. In tonight's talk, recorded two days ago in New York, Dr. King places in this current practical context his theoretical reflections on non-violence and social change. There is nothing wrong with the traffic law which says you have to stop for a red light. But when a fire is raging, the fire truck goes right through that red light, and normal traffic had better get out of its way. Or when a man is bleeding to death, the ambulance goes through those red lights at top speed. There is a fire raging now for the Negroes and the poor of this society. They are living in tragic conditions, because of the terrible economic injustices that keep them locked in as an underclass, as the sociologists are now calling it. Disinherited people all over the world are bleeding to death from deep social and economic wounds. They need brigades of ambulance drivers who will have to ignore the red lights of the present system until the emergency is solved. Massive civil disobedience is a strategy for social change which is at least as forceful as an ambulance with its siren on full. In the past ten years, nonviolent civil disobedience has made a great deal of history, especially in the southern United States. When we in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference went to Birmingham, Alabama in 1963, we had decided to take action on the matter of integrated public accommodations. We went knowing that the Civil Rights Commission had written powerful documents calling for change, calling for the very rights we were demanding but nobody did anything about the Commission's report. Nothing was done until we acted on these very issues and demonstrated before the Court of World Opinion the urgent need for change. It was the same story with voting rights. The Civil Rights Commission, three years before we went to Selma, had recommended the changes we started marching for. But nothing was done until in 1965 we created a crisis a nation couldn't ignore. Without violence, we totally disrupted the system, the lifestyle of Birmingham and then of Selma, with their unjust and unconstitutional laws. Our Birmingham struggle came to its dramatic climax when some 3,500 demonstrators virtually filled every jail in that city and surrounding communities, and some 4,000 more continued to march and demonstrate nonviolently. The city knew then, in terms that were crystal clear, that Birmingham could no longer continue to function until the demands of the Negro community were met. The same kind of dramatic crisis was created in Selma two years later. The result on the national scene was the Civil Rights Bill and then the Voting Rights Act, as President and Congress responded to the drama and the creative tension generated by the carefully planned demonstrations. Of course, by now it's obvious that new laws are not enough. 
The emergency we now face is economic, and it is a desperate and worsening situation for the 35 million poor people in America, not even to mention just yet the poor in the other nations. That is a kind of strangulation in the air. In our society, it's murder psychologically to deprive a man of a job or an income. You are in substance saying to that man that he has no right to exist. You are in a real way depriving him of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, denying in his case the very creed of his society. Now millions of people are being strangled that way. The problem is at least national. In fact, it's international in scope. And it is getting worse as the gap between the poor and the affluent society increases. The question that now divides the people who want radically to change that situation is, can the program of nonviolence, even if it envisions massive civil disobedience, realistically expect to meet such an enormous, entrenched evil.